O Father, which art in heaven, we're so thankful for your presence that is with us this morning. What is man that you're so mindful of us, O God? We're so thankful for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You know, it is a tremendous blessing that we have the privilege of being called the children of God. Amen? Amen. Do you know that on this earth that there are no one more blessed than those who are the children of Jesus Christ? There are those who think that it is very special to be related to what they call movie stars or what they call rap stars. or We think that's very special when we know someone who are monarchs of a different country in that country. But what is it to be the child of the heavenly king? It is a wonderful thing. What do you say? Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, the third chapter? I believe that we're living in a very special time. Do you believe that? I want to thank God for bringing us here safely. And I don't know what's happening, but it seems like the devil in bad weather try to follow us. We were in Africa some months back, and they were in as a part of Africa that they said that it was a drought and that all the farmers, that they, they were in trouble, there was no rain. And I told them, don't worry if we come, it'll be all right. We got there about the second night, the rain began to start trying to descend. We went to Illinois a few weeks back. When we got there, before we got there, it was spring. You know, it's supposed to be spring. Is that right? We got there, all of a sudden, a, foot of, uh, a few inches of snow dropped the very day. And we come here, and I saw the week before, it looked like everything was going to be all right. Right here in Maryland, everything was nice. And all of a sudden, the temperature went to start plummeting. I don't know what's going on. I pray it stops now. Amen? I know that if it doesn't stop now, though, it will stop when we get to heaven. All of the weather is going to be perfect there. I, I want to be there. What about you? I'm so glad to be with you. I'm thankful for your pastor. I won't say his name to protect the innocent, but I'm thankful for the pastor inviting us to be with you. And I believe that any time that a pastor wants to open up his church so that we can understand the real issue, when many are afraid to do so, you should say amen. amen. You should praise God for a pastor who is not afraid to open up the word of God when it comes from Jesus. What do you say? And so I think we should pray for him and every other pastor, even those pastors that are not giving the message for this time. I believe that they are still a part of a family that we should be praying for. Amen. Amen. Right here in Silver Spring, Maryland, there needs to be someone that can lift the standard because I told you already that there are more demons here than on any other place in the entire uh, earth. That means that we need more angels here. What do you say? We've been studying all this week, uh, this Sabbath weekend, a series that has been titled The Real Issue and the Final Generation. We haven't left that. We dealt with something last night called spiritual what? Amnesia. Now, when a man has amnesia, he's forgotten who he is. And I showed you that the great problem in the denomination, the great problem in the denomination is not Jesuits. Someone says, are there Jesuits? Yes, there's some Jesuits, but that's not our greatest problem. Someone says, well, the greatest problem is women ordination. Are there women ordination? Yes, but that's not our greatest problem. Someone looks and says, well, the greatest problem is the drums and in the church. Yes, that's a problem, but that's not our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is that we have developed spiritual amnesia. We've forgotten who we are. And when a man does not know who he is, he will act like anybody else. Am I right or wrong? And all you've got to do to that man to bring him back to his senses so that he stops trying to act like Babylon and dress like Babylon and preach like Babylon and teach like Babylon and live like Babylon and show that man that that man is someone better than Babylon. He's a child of Jesus Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, we found out that this is the real issue. That Jesus has been in that most holy place now for over 172 years. This is the real issue and the devil doesn't want Jesus to come out of the most holy place. Because when Jesus comes out, the devil is in trouble. Am I right or wrong? I mean, think of it, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not like us. He will not leave heaven until his work is done. And you and I, we can leave work. We may not finish work, but we'll leave it. 
Jesus does not leave work until his work is finished. Jesus would not leave this earth and go back to heaven until he could say to his father, he could say the last three words that he uttered on the cross. He said, it is finished. He would not leave this earth until his work on earth was done. But when he went to the most holy place, listen, his work's not done yet. Jesus will not leave heaven until his work is done. And so the devil's plan is to stop him from finishing that work. This is the real issue. And my brothers and sisters, I know that unless there is a special message presented, this will never take place. And someone says, well, every message will present this. No. Inspiration says, it says, it is, what's the next two words? Really. In the day to feed with I'm going to tell you something. If, if you want milk, you have Safeway over there. You have shoppers right over there. You can go down to, to, to all these other grocery stores. But in the Seven Adventist Church, we shouldn't have milk. You know that, don't you? We have all these stars putting white mustaches on top of their lips saying, got milk. Then you come to the church and the ministers have white mustaches, not because they're aged, but because they say we got milk. Well, you know what inspiration says? It is too late in the day to feed with milk. If souls a month or two old in the what? Someone said, well, people just came in the church a month, just two months in the church. What do we give them? Inspiration tells us. It says that those souls who just come in a month or two in the truth who are about to enter the time of trouble, not like every other time, but a time of trouble such as what? Never was. Inspiration says if they cannot hear, not some of it, if they cannot hear how much? All of the straight truth. Or endure the strong meat of the straightness of the way. How will they? What's the next word? You see, that's God's whole purpose. Many are sitting down in congregations, but God wants to produce seven Adventists that can stand in this last hour. It says, how can they stand if they can't hear this? In the day of battle. Now let's read this together. What does it say? Truths that we have been years learning must be learned in a, in a few months. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe the prophet? Now you need to understand that this last presidential administration with the change of leadership from Obama to Donald Trump is very prophetic. We began to introduce it last night. We're going to study it later on this evening in fullness my brothers and sisters, it is one of the greatest evidences in our world today that we have no more time left. And some, when you voted, you thought you did something. You, you, you put a little pin on, I voted. You should have had a pin on that said, I'm a fool. <laughs> Someone said, well, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. No, you voted for a man. And I don't care whether it's a Democrat or Republican, he's still a man. Am I right or wrong? And the last time I checked, the Bible says that man cannot help us. Man will leave his breath and die on you. That our only safety is not in a political party on this earth, but on the party called Jesus Christ. Amen. Why, if you're a Democrat, you've been let down. Am I right or wrong? Why, Donald Trump told you already that all the Democrats have let you down. He said every person in this world that the Democrats have let you down. Didn't he tell you that? Yes or no? Well, he was right about that. Then the Democrats told you that Donald Trump can't help you. Didn't they tell you that, yes or no? Well, they were right about that. I think they both were right. I think that the Republicans in trouble and the Democrats in trouble, and what they didn't say was that who we should vote for is Jesus. Amen. That would have got my vote. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that we have but a few months left. And man is depending on man to take us out of this crisis. But I'm going to tell you something. Man has gotten us into this crisis, and man can't get us out. There must come a revelation from a sky. There must come help from the most holy place. And that man's name, I love his name. You like his name? What's his name? Jesus. That's our only hope. In fact, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 3, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen, in Ezekiel, the third chapter, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says altogether, it says, Son of man, I have made thee an entertainer. Is that what the Bible says? I have made thee a comedian. Is that what the Bible says? 
I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Now, the watchman, his main purpose, he has to be set in a strategic position where he can see <clears throat> everything that is taking place. And once he can get in that position to see what's coming, that when a crisis takes place, that watchman is not to sit back and quiet, but he's to give the trumpet a what? Well, my question is, brothers and sisters, why are not the watchmen blowing the trumpet today? How can you come to church week after week and prayer meeting at the prayer meeting and still believe that we have 100 years to live in this world? Why is not someone telling us with greater fervency that it's time to stop playing games with God and coming to church with a bunch of foolishness and now trying to recognize that we're living in the anti-typical day of atonement? We've forgotten this. The Bible says that God is going to set a watchman on his house. The Bible says, therefore, watchmen, hear the word where? Not by what a man says, not by what the television says. Hear the word at what? My mouth. It's a beautiful mouth Jesus has. And it says, and give them, what's the next word? Warning. Don't give them entertainment. Give them warning. And it's amazing that our pulpits have become stand-up comedian acts. You think that a man is Steve Harvey on this pulpit. No, don't tell me to preach it. I want us to listen to it. <laughs> you see, the problem right now is that too long today, we have been so long coming to church unrecognizing the fact that God's presence is here. Amen. It should make a man look when he comes to church. The first sign that he's come to the presence of God should not be that he's laughing. You know, when a person, when a person says they, they, they've been falling all over themselves, laughing, rolling around. <laughs> I had church today. We had church. Let me tell you something. If you really had church, when you left here, instead of laughing, our tears should be streaming off our faces. Amen. We should be leaving the church saying, Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you know, my brothers and sisters, that one of the greatest signs of the Holy Spirit is not first comfort. The first work of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is to convict the sinner of sin. Am I right or wrong? Amen. Not congratulate the sinner for sinning. How much he can sin and still make it to heaven. You know that's what we want to hear. We want to be able to come to church and wear what we want, eat what we want, live how we want, pray like we want, worship like we want, do what we want, and still the minister pat us on the back and tell us it's all right as long as you pay tithe, it's all right as long as you come to church, it's all right as long as you say the name of Jesus. But the Bible says that men are going to come in my name and deceive many. Bible says that men are going to say, Lord, didn't I do this and that? And Jesus is going to say, but I never knew you. I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. God does that. I'm going to tell you the end. Before I even get there, I'm going to tell you the end result is this. The greatest thing that you and I can do right now is develop such an intimate relationship with Jesus Amen. where we know him as a friend. That's the, I promise you, when, when, when we finish today, you're going to see it. So I better tell you this before I tell you that. Amen? That the greatest objective, the greatest purpose, the greatest thing that you and I can do in this last generation is make sure that we're so acquainted with God. We're so familiar with Jesus that we know him not as a casual person, but that we know him as a daily companion and as a familiar friend. You see, when you know Jesus like that, that is going to produce a change in our experience. I want to know him like that. What do you say? And so the Bible says, give them warning from me, verse 18. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt, what's the next two words? Not might die, but thou shalt what? Surely die. Now, if God says that, a minister, a mouthpiece, should repeat what God says. Am I right? But the Bible says, but if you do not say that, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. Now, notice the objective of the warning message. Is the objective of the warning message condemnation? Yes or no? What does the text say? It says, to warn him from his wicked way, what's the next line say? To save his life. What is the purpose of the warning message? Not condemnation, but salvation. 
Now that's love. What do you say? That's friendship. What do you say? You see, you shouldn't want a friend that's going to tell you what you want. You see, if you were getting ready to get married and you had a friend, that friend should tell you if you marry that man, he's going to bring you straight to hell. You know, there's some men out there like that. You know that, don't you? Now, if you don't, if don't, your friend won't tell you, I'll tell you. There's some men out there, women, that if you marry them, they will send you to hell. And men, listen to me. The devil knows how to wear stilettos. He knows how to wear high heels and a mini skirt, and he will wear it well, brothers and sisters. And there's some women that if you marry, they will send you straight to hell. Does the Bible say those words, yes or no? I'm just repeating what the Bible says. In Proverbs, the seventh chapter, it says that her gates are the gates to hell. My brothers and sisters, someone should be their friend. If you really have a friend, they will tell you, don't marry that man. Don't marry that woman. What does the Bible say? Am I right or wrong? Now, do you want a friend like that? Yes or no? Or do you want a friend that after you now got divorced and you're in trouble, you wish you never met him, now you want the friend and say, why didn't you tell me? Well, the problem is you didn't have a true friend. The Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase him. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It says that the purpose of the warning is to save his life. Now, if that warning is given, it says, the same wicked man shall die where? But if that messenger didn't give the warning message, notice what it says. But his blood will I require where? Do you know that the, the, that messenger, listen, that's why I don't play behind the pulpit. I don't play as a messenger of God. You see, my brother and sister, you say something to me, that's all right. You say something about some other thing, that's all right. But when you say something about God, his truth, his church, his message, now you got a problem. Do you understand? You see, the messenger must defend Jesus with his life. That is what a shepherd is. And that shepherd will give his life for the sheep. When you see a minister that will be willing to tone down the message for fear of some type of unconverted leader that will censor him and punish him for lifting the trumpet, just know that you're looking not at a shepherd but a hireling. There's a difference between the two. Both of them look at the sheep. But a hireling is a paid looker. And when he is threatened with his life, he runs from the wolf. But not a shepherd. You know what the shepherd does? That shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I want to be a shepherd. What do you say? Jesus is a shepherd. What do you say? And so the Bible says that God is going to have somebody to, 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 to stand. In fact, in verse 19 it says, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from what? From his wickedness, someone says, Minister, do you really believe that if you give this warning message that every Seventh-day Adventist youth and adult will stop playing games with God? That if you tell them to be quiet in church, if you tell them to bring their Bibles, if you tell them to focus, revive, and reform, do you mean that every Seventh-day Adventist is going to listen? Now listen, I am not foolish enough to believe that. But do you know that it is not the job of the messenger to force a man to receive the message? The messenger's job is simply to give the message. And when the message is given, if we selfishly and sinfully cherish sin, hold on to, dar you know, we pet sin. We, we hold on to darling sins, and we don't want nobody to touch it. If we do that to sin, guess what? We'll be lost with the sin. But Jesus wants to save the sinner from the sin. Bible says they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people not in their sin, but what? From their sin. The Bible says that if you give the message, if you warn the wicked and he turn not from his wicked wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall, what's the next word? Die in his sin. Both times the sinner dies. But to the messenger the word says, but thou hast what? delivered thy soul. And I think that I ought to say this before we get deep into our message this morning. If you're looking for a message that's going to make you feel good, I would leave right now. I'll give you the opportunity right now. If you're looking for a message that's going to tell us that you're rich and increase with good and have need of nothing, I give you opportunity to leave right now. No disrespect intended because I believe that everyone here wants Jesus to talk to them. Amen. And so you remember that before the warrior fought in the army of God, they always said that the fearful 
and afraid could leave before the battle. I'm going to tell you something. A battle is getting ready to start. And so before the battle starts, I give you opportunity to leave. Now, having said that, you, you must want to stay. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Interesting says, the people are what? Asleep. Do you believe this? Yes or no? It says, it says the people are asleep in their sins and need to be what? Not pet on the back. Alarm. It says, before they can shake off this lethargy, their ministers have preached what? Smooth things. You come to church, all you heard was smooth things. It says, but God's servants who bear sacred, vital truths should do what? Cry aloud and what else? Now, there is a reason for this. Watch. It says, those who engage in the solemn work of bearing the third angel's message must move out how? Without hesitation. It says, the, the, and in the spirit and power of God, not cowardly, but what? Fearlessly preach the truth and let it cut. It says, they should elevate the standard of truth, not lower, but elevate the standard and urge the people to come up where? Someone says, don't you know the standards are high? Yes, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Amen. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. Someone says, well, lower the standard. No, because if you do, you won't be like Jesus. And the only way to get up there is to have somebody to help us. But guess what? We have a helper whose name is Jesus. It says, it has too frequently been lowered to meet the people where? In their condition of darkness and sin. It is not the smooth testimony. It is the what? Pointed testimony that will bring them up to decide. A peaceful testimony will not do this. It says the people have the privilege of listening to this kind of teaching from what? You know, you can go to any denomination, hear that message all you want, that, 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 that God will allow you to do everything you want, that all you hear is that the, that the only thing that Jesus did was died on the cross. He did that, and that's wonderful, but that's not all he did. That same Jesus went into the most holy place. Am I right? That same Jesus is ministering right now. Am I right? And my brothers and sisters, do you know that the prophet says that without the cross, that the most holy place would be ineffective? And then the prophet says that without the most holy place, that the cross would be ineffective. Which one do we need? Both. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, the people have the privilege of listening to this kind of teaching from popular pulpits. But those servants to whom God has entrusted the solemn, fearful message, which is to bring out and fit up a people for the coming of Christ, should bear a what? Plain, pointed testimony, just like John the Baptist. Amen. And nobody was more pointed than Jesus. Jesus said, you see, I, I think that we misunderstand the ministry of Christ. You know, most people say, oh, we wish Jesus were here. I don't think that the average seven Adventists would really want Jesus to preach in their church. You go back to the Jewish nation, the ancient seven Adventists. When Jesus went to his home church, I can imagine it was called remnant back then too. He went to his home church. And when he went to his home church, brothers and sisters, his first sermon, not his second, third, his first sermon, they were upset. They took him to the brow of a hill and tried to throw him off the mountain. Am I right or wrong? Now, if the history would be repeated, I wonder if we would do the same thing today. Now, the common people heard him gladly, but, 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 but the real, many of the religious leaders, many of them, were offended by the plain preaching of Jesus, and the same thing is happening today. Someone says, do you know if you preach the plain truth, you'll be in trouble? Yes, I'm already in enough trouble already. I can't get any more, no, more trouble. But do you know that every man in the Bible has been in trouble? You know that? You tell me a man of God in the Bible that wasn't in trouble. Look at Isaiah. He was cut in half. Am I right or wrong? Look at Jeremiah. He was thrown into a pit of dung, animal's waste, almost up to his chin. Look at Peter. He was crucified upside down. Look at James. His head was cut off. Look at John the Baptist. His head cut off. You don't have a man in the Bible that stood that wasn't in trouble. And what makes you think that you can be without trouble today? Even Elijah was called a troublemaker. But look at precious Jesus. What did they do to him? They put him to a cross. And so my brothers and sisters, in these last days, we cannot look at that inspiration says, let the truth cut. It says, spare not, cry aloud, and leave the results. 
with God. And so, my friends, today I believe that if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. We're going to be studying to a subject called Get Ready, Get Ready, Get Ready. Before we get into that message more deeply, would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? I think that we need to say, Lord, forget this congregation, and Lord, it's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And after a few moments of silent prayer and meditation, we'll get into the message this morning more deeply. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's talk to Jesus. O God of Abraham, O God of Isaac, O God of Israel and of the remnant church, I plead with you this Sabbath morning that you will allow it to be known today that you are God in the remnant church and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your command. Hear me, O Lord, please hear me. And send your spirit from heaven. Unseal the fountain of heaven and allow a blessing to be poured out in deep conviction of heart so that we might get ready before it is too late. I plead, Lord, that our hearts will be turned back again and that we will see that if ever there was a time to get ready, that the time is now. I pray, O oh God, that you will give us as much of the Holy Spirit that we can physically receive without being physically consumed by your presence. I pray, Lord, that you will do something this morning that will cause demons in hell to tremble, but will make heaven happy. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm just a weak, feeble, fickle, frail man. Please, Lord, we need the Holy Spirit. Abide with us this morning. For we ask all of this in the worthy name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation chapter 12. You're going to the book of Revelation chapter 12, and when you get there, if you will let me know by saying amen. amen. If you were here last night, you understand from the Word of God that we are living in no ordinary time. We found that we are living in the time where the real issue is at stake. And those who understand the real issue, they can see in the events that are taking place all about us, the development of a coming storm. Not just a regular storm, but a prophetic storm is developing all around us. In fact, my brothers and sisters, it does not matter anywhere you look, you can see that the handwriting is on the wall. Whether you were to look politically, ec educationally, economically, religiously, socially, everywhere you turn, the handwriting is on the wall telling us that time cannot continue much longer. In fact, we study that that great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward now for nearly 6,000 years is about to end. And everywhere we go, we need to understand this. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, Satan understands that his attack on this generation has to be greater than on any other preceding generation. Why? He understands that this is not the first generation, that this is the final generation, and that means something in the sanctuary. In fact, go to Revelation chapter 12, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verse 12, let's read that together. The Bible says, therefore, what's the next word? Rejoice, ye heavens, 
and ye that dwell in them. But notice the change in the tone. Rejoice heaven, but notice now. It says, woe to what else? The inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Why? For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath. Why does his wrath get greater? It says, because. He doesn't guess. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, because he knoweth that he hath but a what? He knows this. And my brothers and sisters, Satan is a mastermind of understanding the time. In fact, he recognizes this to the point where everything he's doing now is to take possession of the minds of youth and adults and the devil, he's doing his job well. You look right now today, he's created every device to gain control of man's mind. You know what the prophet says in Great Controversy? The prophet says, Satan well knows that those whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. And so it says, this is what the prophet says, that he invents Every possible, you know the next word? Device. Now you know that was a prophet. Now tell me, what you call your cell phone today? Device. What you call your iPad today? Device. What you call all of your so-called technology today? Device. The prophet never saw it, and yet she said the devil will create devices, and today most of this generation is what we can call a T and T generation. You say, what do you mean? I'm not talking about dynamite. T and T is talking about we are a text and tweet. Tweet and text. T and T generation. You say what I mean? Everywhere you go, you've got to tweet somebody. It's amazing how the devil does. You change your socks, tweet. I mean, who cares? You change your socks. You put on a sweater, tweet. Who cares? We are moved by foolishness when the real issue is right before our very eyes. Not only tweet, but text. Tweet, text. You go now to the church, you text. It's amazing. You know we should drop dead texting in church. You go to school, text. Final exam, text. You go to the airplane, text. Everywhere, text. In fact, I, I, I don't know why, but even on the toilet, you got to text. I mean, tell me the truth, brothers and sisters. We are a texting generation, and it's amazing. I tell every congregation. It's amazing. Every text the devil gives us, we answer. Every text the world gives us, we answer. But in the Bible, God has given us over 30,000 texts. We don't answer one. How has the devil taken possession of our minds? What has the devil done for you to make you so loyal to him? That you will answer his texts. You will eat his food. You will put on his clothes. You will listen to his music. You will go to his places of entertainment. What has the devil done for you to make you so loyal to him? When Jesus has given us his life, Jesus is ministering for us right now. How is it that Jesus died for us and we live for the devil? I don't know about you, but I'm going to say this. Jesus died for me, so I'm going to live for him. What do you say? And so my brothers and sisters, we see that the devil has almost complete possession of this generation. But the Bible says the reason why is because he knows that his time is so short. In fact, I want you to notice what the prophet says about this in the book, Early Writings, page 119. Let's read it together. It says, what? I saw, not the world, but I saw that the remnant were not prepared. It says, for what is coming upon the earth? Stupidity like what? Lethargy seem to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we are having not the first message, but the what? And then the prophet says, in awful solemnity, she gives one phrase that is repeated with increasing intensity. And you know what the phrase says? It says, my angel cried out with awful solemnity. Let's say it together. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. For the fierce thing of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out, unmixed with mercy, and you are not ready. Rend your what? Heart and not your garment. A great work must be done for the realm. I'm going to tell you something. A great work must take place with us, and it's going to happen both on the inside and on the outside to a place that we will look just like Jesus. And so the message of heaven is, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's almost like what Jesus said to Judas. You remember what Jesus said to Judas? He said, whatever you do, you better do it quickly. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 12, notice, last line, I want you to zero in on this. Last line of verse 12 says, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because, notice, he doesn't guess. 
because he, what's the next word, knoweth that he had but a... Now tell me something. How is it that the devil has been so successful in tricking us? Why, the devil knows his time is short. It seems like everybody knows this but Seventh-day Adventists. The devil knows it. The world knows it. The popular, uh, the, 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 the popular Babylonian churches know it. I'm going to show you. That even right now, brothers and sisters, the early Christian church knew it. They said, knowing the time that now it is high time to do what? Awake out of sleep. Do you know that the early Adventists knew it? The Seventh-day Adventist pioneers knew it. And the only ones dumb enough to think that we can't know it is you and me. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that even the Pope knows the time? Look what it says. Everywhere I go, it's amazing to me. It says, Time Magazine says, here's in Time Magazine, look what it says. It says, I feel, this is what the Pope said. Let me back it up. It says, Pope Francis says, his tenor may be less than what? Now, this is in 2015. Now, I was back here maybe about 2013. I think I was here last four years ago, and we talked about some of these things. This had not happened yet. Other things did not take place yet. We're going to show you today that time is almost finished. It says, I feel that the Lord has placed me here for a what? Now, listen to me. Who said that? The very words are in Scripture. The devil says he knows that he had but a short time. And if you won't believe the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, maybe you believe Time magazine. Said so it's time, brothers and sisters. Now, we know that the world and the devil know his time is short. But my question is this. How does the devil know that his time is short? Is it because he's infinite in knowledge? Is that how he knows? No, the devil's a created man. Inspiration tells us that the same way he knows it is how we can know it if we study. And Prophets and Kings, page 686, let's read this together. What does it say? It says, when God's what? When God's written word was given through the Hebrew prophets. Not man, but what? Satan. Satan. What's that next word? Does the devil study, yes or no? Is it enough just to study your Bible? No. Do you know, brothers and sisters, the devil studies, but the problem is the devil studies, but he doesn't trust and obey. You see, the songwriter says, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to what? Trust and obey. Interesting says, it says, Satan studied with diligence the messages concerning the Messiah. Carefully, he traced the words that outlined with unmistakable clearness, Christ, what's that next word? Work among men. We showed you last night the importance of this word. It says, as a suffering, what's the next word? Now, give me the symbol for that suffering sacrifice, a lamb. It says, and as a what? Conquering king. What symbol is that? A priest. Someone says, I thought there was a difference. But remember, there was such a thing called the Melchizedek priesthood. Melchizedek was a priest and a king at the same time. It says, this is talking about the lamb and the priest. It says that, that, that Satan studied the work as a lamb and as this conquering king priest. And in the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures, he read that, what's the next two words? That one who was to appear. When you see that capital one, you know that's only one man. I love his name. What's his name? Jesus. It says that one was to appear, who was to be brought as a lamb to the slaughter. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the what? These prophecies caused Satan to do what? Fear and tremble. I love to make the devil tremble. What do you say? Amen. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. What do you think of all the prophecies from Genesis to Malachi, but all the way through Revelation, what do you think is one of the prophecies that makes Satan the most frightened every time he reads it, every time he sees it? What do you think is the prophecy he hates the most? Talk to me, somebody. Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse. You know what it says, and I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now notice that seed, Jesus, what's he going to do to the devil? It shall do what? Bruise or crush his head. The devil is afraid of that. You see, all the other prophecies tell us in successive stages through the plan of redemption, but there in Genesis 3.15, you have the end of the story. And the end of the story is that the devil's going to die with a head crushed just like a serpent. And I'm going to tell you something, in order to really kill a serpent, you've got to crush his head. Someone says, well, do you have any serpents? And I've killed many of serpents before in my garden, out in the country where we live. I kill many of them. And the only way you know he's really dead is when his head is crushed. Now, someone says, well, what type of serpent did you kill? I don't take time to look at that. <laughs> I know what type of serpent it is because the only good snake is a dead one. 
Now, my brothers and sisters said these prophecies caused Satan to fear and tremble, yet he relinquished not his what? Purpose to dwarf. What does dwarf mean? To try to prevent or stop. It says he tried to stop, if possible, the merciful provisions of Jehovah for the redemption of what? The devil's game plan is to try to stop the plan of redemption. And so he studied the Bible to try to understand this plan. He first saw it introduced in Genesis 3.15. Am I right? But do you know that when Satan got the greatest revelation about the plan was when God made a sanctuary. The Bible said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. When he made that sanctuary, do you know, brothers and sisters, that when God made that sanctuary, Satan looked at it and Satan began to study. He saw outlined in that sanctuary the plan of defeat. He noticed that in that sanctuary, everything was built on a great clock of time. The Bible says to everything there's a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. Last night, I showed you from Scripture that the sanctuary must finish on time. Satan understands that his game plan is to stop this. It says for 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. But now, at the end of 6,000 years, all have made their what? Decision. At the end of 6,000 years, it says the time has what? You know, I can literally show you quotation after quotation after quotation, text after text after text that shows us that the end of this time of Jesus in the most holy place would take us to the limit of 6,000 years, and Jesus is getting ready to leave heaven. I showed you last night that that 6,000 years is almost up. Now, my brothers and sisters, when that 6,000 years is finished, that priest is going to come out the sanctuary. That fit man, that timely man is going to bring Satan. And Jesus is going to confess on his head all of the what? Sins of God's people that have been cleansed from the sanctuary. Is this our message, yes or no? This is the day of atonement. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is what brought us into existence. Now, Satan studied this plan and found out what he didn't know before, that the plan of redemption was broken up into three parts. How many parts? Three parts. Represented by the work in the outer court, the work in the holy place, and the work in the most holy place. Let's say it together. How many places? What are the three places? What's the first? Outer court. Second, holy place. Third, most holy place. Now, I'm going to give you a warning. I see somebody talking. I see, I see some people talking that shouldn't be talking. I'm going to give you a warning the first time. I don't want you to have to be embarrassed. This is not a place to talk. You have all of Maryland to talk, but if you come into this room, we want to hear Jesus. Amen. Amen. And there'll be plenty of people outside that want to take your place if you don't want to be here. Amen. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know what the Bible says? Hold fast lest somebody steals your what? Now, listen, I don't want nobody stealing my crown. I believe that Jesus can manufacture enough crowns and for someone to steal mine. Now, this says that Satan understood through the sanctuary that the plan of redemption will be broken up into three parts. And the devil says, I see it. He knew that the name of the game was just like baseball. Three strikes, and guess what? You're out. Holy place, most holy place. He knew that that 6,000 years would be broken up into that time because after Jesus finished the work inside the most holy place, the priest, having cleansed the sanctuary, would come out of that sanctuary and he would do something with that scapegoat. He would take his hands and put them where? 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 Does the Bible say so, yes or no? Where does the Bible say so? In Leviticus. Let's go there quickly. Leviticus 16. We studied this last night. Go to Leviticus 16. Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Do you know, brothers and sisters, it was the day of atonement that brought the seven of church into existence. It was the day of atonement that caused us to understand where Jesus is, what he's doing. But in this final generation, we have developed spiritual amnesia. We've forgotten who we are. And the Bible says, Leviticus 16. Beginning in verse 20, talking about the Day of Atonement. Notice now at the end of the Day of Atonement, beginning in verse 20, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read it together. The Bible says, and when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place, talking about the most holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation, which is the holy place, and the altar, he shall bring the what? Now question, is this at the beginning of the Day of Atonement or the end of the Day of Atonement? How do we know? It says, when he had made an end. Now, notice the end of David told me, verse 21. Verse 21 says, and Aaron, the high priest representing Jesus, shall lay how many hands? Both his hands upon the tail of the scapegoat. I'm making sure you're studying. Last night we pointed this out. Question. Why does he put his hand on the head of the scapegoat as opposed to his tail or to his feet or to his back? Why the head? Talk to me. Talk to me. 
Because it's time to do what? Crush his head. It started at Calvary, but that work wasn't finished at Calvary. It's going to be finished on the Day of Atonement in the Most Holy Place. And the Bible says that as a result of this, now notice what crushes his head. What crushes his head is not the hands of the priest. What crushes the head of the scapegoat? Notice, let's continue. It says, and confess or transfer over him how much? All the iniquities of the children of Israel. Question, what is iniquity? What's that talking about? Sin. Sin. All the iniquities. What else? And all their what? Sin. Question, what is transgression? What is it? Sin. And then it goes on to say, and what else? And all their what? Sin. Three times. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. Why three times? Oh, we don't have time to explain why three times. I'm going to tell you this. This is the same reason why inspiration says get ready, get ready, get ready. You will notice that there's a rhythm in the threes. There's a rhythm in the Godhead. There's a rhythm in how this thing takes place. And my brothers and sisters, there is a rhythm that the devil is trying to counterfeit. You will notice that he has a counterfeit threefold union that we're going to talk about later on. But the Bible says that the devil wants to destroy God, but God has the end of the say. He's going to put all those sins, all those transgressions, all of those iniquities, and he's going to put them on the head of the goat. And shall send them away by the hand of a fit man where? Now, my brothers and sisters, how much sin is going to be put on the head of Satan? How much sin? Now, if all of the sin is going to be put on the head of Satan, how much sin will they be left with? How much? Now, if they have no sin left, because all, the Bible said all, is going to be gone at the end of the Day of Atonement, then if they have no sin left and they're left with no sin, then they're not sinful. They are what? Sinless. Sinless. So at the end of the Day of Atonement, God must produce a sin, not full generation. We got that already. What he wants to produce is a sinless generation, and this is the real issue in the final generation. Can God produce? Now, I know today, being so close, being so close to some of our sinners of influence, I know today that the devil has taught us that we're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. That man can't be brought back to perfection. But my brothers and sisters, it's not in the Bible. If a man is sinning until Jesus comes, he's going to be lost. Jesus is to take us out of sin. Jesus is to give us victory over sin. And it's amazing. All you got to do is ask one simple question. What sin is more powerful than Jesus Christ? You see, when you start talking ambiguously and carelessly, oh, we can't get victory over sin, that's when you talk carelessly. But when you start getting practical, tell me what sin is more powerful than my Savior. Is an evil temper stronger than Jesus? Is pornography stronger than Jesus? Is homosexuality stronger than Jesus? Is fornication stronger than Jesus? Is pride stronger than Jesus? Is selfishness stronger than Jesus? Then what is stronger than Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. Then that means that we can overcome. Amen. Because where sin abounds, Amen. grace doesn't abound. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace did what? Much more abound. Then tell me, brothers and sisters, why do we sing about it if we don't believe it? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's what? Power in the blood power in the blood, would you over evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Why do we sing it if we don't believe it? Maybe that's why the hymns got thrown out and now you put in this place Kirk Franklin. You put in this place uh, Lionel Harris. You put in this place Richard Smallwood. This will not give us victory on the Day of Atonement. That small wood's going to make you small. You see, brothers and sisters, you've got to understand God is trying to lift us up Richard Smallwood knows nothing of the Day of Atonement. Do you know that if a minister on the Day of Atonement, if they would have allowed a pagan musician into the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement, they would have been struck dead? We're in the anti-typical Day of Atonement. We have spiritual amnesia. We have lost our knowledge of who we are. My brothers and sisters, God is trying to bring us back to this day. The Bible says that at the end of that day of atonement, somebody is going to get victory. Someone says, well, that's because you're uneducated, you're unintelligent. If you go to our schools and get a Ph.D., that maybe you'll be become more intelligent. Maybe that might be part of our problem. We think we're too wise, sometimes wiser than God. 
In fact, I want to see if anybody drove here today. Let me see the hand of somebody drove here today. All right, my brother. Uh, what color vehicle did you drive? He drove a white vehicle. All right. I put you on the spot, but it's okay. Now, let's say, I say to this brother, he drives here today saying he has a white vehicle. And I say to him, now, I know, brother, you think it was a white vehicle, but I have my Ph.D. in colors. <laughs> I know the Greek and the Hebrew of colors, and I know that what you think is white is really neon purple. What would you say, brother? You say, oh, well, he has his PhD. I guess that settles it. Is that what you say? No. No, my brothers and sisters, you say when you're right mind, I know what you say, but I also know what I see. John the Revelator says the same. Now, I don't care what man comes up and say, well, the Greek says this, the Hebrew says this. John the Revelator says, I know what I saw. In Revelation 14, as a result of the third angel's message, there, there is a people produced that says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God. They're not sinning, repenting, falling, slobbering, getting back up, falling back down. It says, here they are. They keep the commandments of God. Why? Because they have the faith of Jesus. They love Jesus so much that they would rather die than sin. This will vindicate God's character before the universe. There must be seen that a people can be produced who can live on this earth without sin under the power of the devil and still through the power of Jesus live victoriously over every sin. This will show that there's glory and power in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want to be on that side. What do you say? God is going to give a full and final display of this love of God. And the devil is trying to stop this work because he knows that at the end, this is what's going to take place. Now, what happens to Satan when the work of redemption on the Day of Atonement comes to an end? His head will be crushed. So his game plan is to try to stop this from taking place. Inspiration says, what shall I say to arouse or wake up the remnant people of God? I was shown that what? Dreadful scenes are before them. Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear, not just upon the world, but upon what? God's people. Why? He knows that if they sleep, no pictures right now. We just want to take no, no more pictures, please. We're in the day of atonement. No more pictures. It says, it says, he knows that if they sleep a little longer, he is what? Sure of them, for their destruction is certain. The devil says they don't have to sleep forever. The devil says that if they sleep just a little longer, why? Because he knows that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven and let me tell you something we're wasting time but time is running out now notice it's reason says so what is satan's game plan satan's game plan is simple but effective it is to try to prevent jesus from finishing his work in the most holy place until the time runs out how many ever ever played basketball before you ever played basketball before let me tell you something if you had a team that was up by one and you know that this month uh, uh, that, that just passed was called March Madness. Am I right? March Madness. And if you don't know that, that's that, that, that basketball terminology. That March Madness will drive you mad. But I'm going to tell you something, that in the midst of the best thing it could have taught you was this, that if in basketball a man's up by one, he's trying to win the championship, and he has the ball, he's not trying to make a shot if he's up by one. You know what he's going to do? He's going to try to eat up the clock. All he wants to do is waste up the time. Waste the time until the time does what? Runs out. Now, do you understand that right now in the day, it appears as if the devil is up by one? You see, in order for Jesus to win, he must bring somebody back to perfection. Jesus must bring us back to a sinless condition. And so the devil says, all I got to do is keep the ball. Let them hold on. The ball is not a real ball. The ball is sin. That if he can keep sin in our hands on just a little while longer, then Satan would win the great controversy. And so, my brothers and sisters, you know the devil says? He flatters himself. Watch now. It says, ever since his fall, Satan has been at work to establish himself as ruler of this earth. He saw the sacrificial offerings, which have been uh, uh, ordained to represent Christ as dying for the race. He tried in every possible way to so pervert them that the people would lose sight of their what? Now, let's read this together. It says, from the Jewish age, when? Down to the... You can say on down to 2017. Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son of God and his what? Work. Remember, there's a work in the outer court, work in the holy place, work in the most holy place, but at the end of the work in the most holy place, Satan's head will be 
So his only plan is stop Jesus from finishing the work inside the most holy place until the time runs out because it has to happen on time. It says, and he still, watch the devil, he still does what? Flatters himself that he will obtain the victory. The devil says, I can win. Someone says, well, that doesn't even make sense. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's logical, even though it's not biblical. You say, what do I mean? You tell me a generation that's ever got victory over sin. Look through the 6,000 years. Abraham, he sinned. David, he sinned. Moses, he sinned. You don't have a generation in the Bible that ever came to a place where every member of God's church was in a sinless condition. You show me one generation. In 6,000 years, you show me one. And so if you look logically, it looks like Satan would win. Am I right or wrong? But he's not going to win. Praise God! I know the end of the story, and it's called the story of redemption. Now watch. It goes further. Satan wants to stop this work, but I'm going to tell you something. He is not going to stop this work. You see, God's plan of redemption is going to be successful. It's going to be, and I, I like to use this illustration because I want to make it as simple and as practical as I can to everyone here. Jesus in the sanctuary has something called a wash machine. A what? A heavenly wash machine. I praise God he has one too. You see, because I'm a sinner and I needed some washing. What do you say? Now listen to me. I don't care how expensive your wash machine is or how economic your wash machine is. You know, that's a fancy word of saying cheap. Amen. I don't care how expensive or economic your, your, your wash machine is. They only have three great phases to the one cycle. Three, just three phases. Now, if you have a good wash machine and you know what I'm talking about, would you say me, with me the three cycles? What, what's the first one? Wash. Now, someone said, well, no, it's not my washing machine. My, I, I paid a lot of money, $1,000. My washing machine has pre-wash. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Now, listen, I don't care whether it's pre-wash, after-wash, for-wash. It can even be mouthwash. <laughs> it's still, guess what? Wash. 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 What else? Rinse. What else? Spit. Let's say it together. Wash. Rinse. Spin. That's the plan of redemption. Let's say it one more time. Wash, rinse, spin. Now, if a man had never seen a washing machine before, and you told him that he had to get his clothes clean on time, and he said, I don't know how to do it. And so you tell him, like, don't worry, there is a washing machine. He said, well, I don't know how it works. You say, come, let's see. And you go to the washing machine. You put your clothes in. You close it up. You start it working. All of a sudden, the light comes on. Boop! And it starts working. Light flashes. And all of a sudden, the, the, the water starts pouring in. It's washing now. And the water starts flooding in. The man looks back. He's wondering what's going on. You said, don't worry. It's washing. And the water drops in on the clothes. All of a sudden, at the period of time, presently, the washing machine stops. When the washing machine stops, the light comes off. The man goes back. He doesn't know what he's doing, so he's getting ready to pick out his clothes. And those who know about washing machines, what do you tell him? Not yet. The man says, not yet. You say, watch. All of a sudden, he stops, and presently, the light comes back on, boom, it switches. It moved from wash to what? Rinse. It got into rinse now, and the machine begins to rinse. The agitator is going, and the rinsing is moving, and the man is looking, man, something is going on. Then the rinse, after a period of time, it does what? Stops. Man doesn't know about washing machines. What does he go to do again? He goes over that washing machine. He tries to lift up the lid. What do you who know about washing machines say? What do you tell him? Not yet. The man backs up. He says, what's now? All of a sudden, presently, the light comes back on, boom. It goes to the last phase. And in that last phase is the what phase? Not the rinse phase, and not the wash phase, but the what? Spin. All of a sudden, that agitator begins to spin violently. And I'm going to tell you something. I always like to remind you. You see, if you have an old-fashioned wash machine, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What does the wash machine do when it gets to the last part of that spin cycle? It begins to start doing what? Bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. It starts shaking. Yes or no? And I'm going to tell you something. When you look in the seven minutes church and you begin to see the shaking taking place, you can know that you're in the final phase of the wash machine in just a little while. That work is going to be finished. My friends, Jesus is about to come. Now watch this. And Tracy tells us that's that third and final phase. In the outer court at the cross, Jesus finished the work. In the holy place, Jesus finished the work. October 22nd, 1844. And the last and third phase is the most holy place, but Jesus has not yet finished his work. And the Satan is trying to make war with the remnant of God's seed. Why? Because he's trying to prevent Jesus from using them to finish the work. But I want to stand for Jesus. What do you say? Now watch this. What's the work? 
The lamb first bought us, then the priest did what? Brought us, brought us where? Back to perfection. Interesting says, to restore in man the what? Image of his maker. To bring him what? Back to the perfection in which he was created. This was to be the work of what? Redemption. This is the redemption work. God must restore in man the image of God. Jesus will bring us back to a sinless condition by the work of the Lamb and by the work of the priest. This is God's plan. But my brothers and sisters, he cannot work on this plan forever. There is a limit. You know what that limit is? You know that, brothers and sisters, we don't have as seven Adventists in 6,000 years. Do you know that when that national Sunday law is passed, it is going to be too late for seven Adventists to try to get sin out of our lives? In fact, go to Revelation. What book did I say? Let's go to Revelation 14. Look at Revelation, the 14th chapter. Now, watch what the prophet says. You're going to Revelation 14. Now, they tell me that there's still people in Maryland who believe in the spirit of prophecy. You believe in the spirit of prophecy? Yes. Praise God. Volume 9, page 97. Let's read that together. It says, there are, what's the next word? Many. Who have not yet heard the testing truths for what? Now we're going to find out she's not talking about seven Adventists. You know right now that the majority of true Christians are not in the seven Adventist church. They're in the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the Presbyterian church, the Episcopalian church. Most of them not even going to church. And I tell you, the greatest devils are in this church. You know that. Now, interesting says, there are many with whom the Spirit of God is what? Strife. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of what? Not for everybody. She's talking about when the Sunday law passes. God is still in mercy going to be allowing judgments to hit this earth, but it says this will still be a time of mercy for those who have had, what's the next word? No opportunity to learn what is truth. Is this talking about seven evidence? Yes or no? No. Seven evidence for 100 years. We've been given the Bible. Someone says, my preacher, not preaching. Well, you have a Bible. Am I right? Bible says, study to show thyself approved to God. You can't blame your minister. You can't blame your school. You can't blame your church. You can't blame your institution when we have a Bible and we can study for ourselves. You have the spirit of prophecy. We can read for ourselves. It is nobody's fault but our own if we're lost. Inspiration says, the time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. But it says, tenderly, will the Lord look upon what? Who is them? Those are those, those non-Adventists who have never heard this before. It says, his heart of mercy is what? Touch. Touch for them. His hand is still stretched out to what? Save who? Those who have never heard this message. But notice at the same time, when that sin law is passed, it says, while the door is what? Closed. To those who would not what? And you tell me, who are those who should have entered before this time? Seven-day Adventists. The judgment will begin with us. God says you must go in there, and I'm telling you something right now, that in 2017 we're in the final moments of time, and God is saying, please, get ready, get ready, get ready. And someone says, how? We've got to go inside that most holy place. You see, in the book of Hebrews, turn there quickly. Hebrews chapter 6, the Bible tells us where God is trying to bring us in this final generation. God must take us there because when that Sunday law is passed, the limit will be reached. The prophet says, by the decree, enforcing the institution of the papacy and violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from what? Righteousness. So may this apostasy, some of the Sunday law, be a sign to us that the, what's the next word? Limit of God's forbearance is when that national Sunday law is passed, God's limit for seven Adventists has been reached. And God will say, either you're ready or you are and do you know that though we have 19 million seven Adventists, that less than 1% even know that the crisis is taking place right before our very eyes. We come to church playing. We come to church talking. We be in church chewing gum, talking back and forth, careless, indifferent, having no idea that probation's hour is fast closing. Interesting says that limit is almost reached. And God is trying to bring us back to this time before this crisis breaks. Why? Because judgment will begin at the house of God. And when that national Sunday law is passed, God's people must be in a sinless condition. Now you say, what do I mean? We start looking at Leviticus 16. Revelation 14 says the same thing. In fact, it says, you know it, repeat it with me. It says, and I saw another what? Angel. Fly in the midst of what? Heaven. 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and... Now notice what he says. You remember what he said. Verse 7. Saying with a loud voice. What do you say? Fear God. And give what? I want to ask you a question. Why are we to give glory to God? What does it say? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is... So when the hour of judgment comes, what condition must we be in at that time? We must give God what? That's the condition. Now I want to ask you a question. Can I sin and give glory to God at the same time? Are you sure? The Bible says in Romans 3, you know the text, Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it says, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So when the hour of judgment comes, I must give God glory. Question, can I sin and give glory to God at the same time? Sin comes short of giving God glory. I mean, think of it. How could sin glorify Jesus? Sin glorifies Satan, but not the Savior. You see, sinlessness gives glory to the blood of Jesus and the power of Jesus Christ. It says, give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Now question, what is my only hope of being brought back to a condition where I can give God glory? You remember where Colossians says in page one, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, it says that the, the mystery that was hid from the Gentiles, which is Christ not knocking at the door of our heart, but Christ where? In us, in you, which is the hope of... Now, what is glory? This sinless condition where we reveal God's character, and the only way back is that we must have Jesus in our hearts. I want Jesus. What do you say? Now, listen to me. If Jesus is in our hearts, can he bring us back to perfection, yes or no? Look at Hebrews 6. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Notice what it says in verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of what? Christ. Let us, what's the next two words? Go on unto what? Perfection. Can Jesus bring us back to perfection, yes or no? Is it in the Bible, yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, this must take place. This is the great work that must happen in a little time. But you know what our question should be? What's that word say right there? Huh. You know, right there is where many people get confused on. They think that they can bring themselves back to a sinless condition. They think that God, either God will do it for them or that they will do it by themselves. In fact, my brothers and sisters, you want to find out that our only hope is that we must get where Jesus is. You see, salvation comes through connection with Christ. But Christ is not in the outer court. Christ is not in the holy place. Christ is where? Where? Inside that most holy place. And our only hope is to get where Jesus is, inside that most holy place. And some people think that the way it's going to happen is like that. You know what this is right here? That's a tow truck. Here's a car broken down. You know, on the roads here in Maryland, you see a lot of this. Am I right? Now, many people think it's going to be just like that. They think that this is God, man, that this going to take man out. They think this is sinful man who got caught in sin. And they think, now, have you ever seen somebody on a tow truck? I've seen it. You know that you can get in those tow trucks, you pay enough money, you don't even have to touch the ignition. You can just sit back and let the tow truck take you all the way in. Am I right? You, can get, you, can, you don't even have to be in the driver's seat. You can get into the passenger seat if you want to. And sit down there and that, you'll be bumping up the road. And still, you think you're going to heaven just like this. And I don't care how many bumps you're going to heaven anyhow. Let me tell you something. Inspiration says, man, what? Cannot be what? Told to heaven. You know, the prophet even saw a tow truck. Praise the Lord. It says, he cannot go as a what? Passive passenger. He must himself use the oars and work as a what? Laborer. How? Now, if I say together, what does that mean? That means God has a part and man has a part. They must be co-workers working together. In fact, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. It says that you are God's husbandry. You are co-laborers with God, laborers together. Now, if God works and man works, I call that relationship. What do you say? That's fellowship. That's friendship. This is the place that God is trying to bring us to in this time. In fact, in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 482, let's read this together. 42, it says, the work of what? 
Gaining salvation is one, not where God does it by himself. It is one of what? Co-partnership. What does co-partner mean? God has a part, man has a part. It says co-partnership between God and the repenting sinner. This is, what's the next word? Not optional, but what? Necessary for the formation of right principles in the character. Man is to make earnest efforts to overcome that which hinders him from attaining to what? Perfection. But he is wholly dependent upon what? God for success. So I'm going to ask you a question. Can we get victory over sin by just trying as hard as we want? Impossible. The Bible says without me you can do what? Nothing. But my brothers and sisters, do you know that we can't do anything without Jesus? The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens me. It says, but he is wholly dependent upon God for success. Human effort of itself is what? Not sufficient. Without the aid of divine power, it avails what? Nothing. God works, and what else? Man works. That means God has a part, and man has a part. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go to 1 Corinthians 3 and notice this from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 3, everything this prophet says, the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. Let's read it together. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. The Bible says, for we are, what's the next word? Give me another word for labor. Give me another word for labor. Workers. The Bible says, we are laborers or workers. How? together with God. So if we're working together, that means God has a part and man has a part. Now my brothers and sisters, this says resistance of temptation must come from man. God can't resist for you. God won't change the channel when you're watching Desperate Housewives. God won't do that. You know, right now today, what, what's one of those shows that come on now? Scandal. Yes, Scandal. Do you know, listen to me. Do you know that God's not going to change the channel while you're watching Scandal? I mean, you know, the, the, the devil has scandalized us. And you're just sitting there watching and don't know, but by beholding, we become what? Change. God will not force you to change your diet and your dress and your music and your worship and your life. God will show you his love. He will show you the truth. He will show you the principles and then say, you must choose for yourself. It says resistance of temptation must come from man who must draw his power from who? God. On the one side, there's infinite wisdom, compassion, and power. And on the other side, our side, there's weakness, sinfulness, absolute helplessness. But do you know that when humanity combines with divinity, that that does not commit sin, God gives us power to live above sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. We have a part. Look what the Bible says in 2 Peter. What book did I say? You're going to 2 Peter chapter 1. All through Scripture, the Bible is the same, showing us that man has his part. Now, my question is, what is our part? You know, on the Day of Atonement, God has told us what our part is. Do you know that what God has told us? God has given us a name for our part on the Day of Atonement. It's called the duty of the congregation on the Day of Atonement. Look what the Bible says. Uh, it says 2 Peter chapter 1. And 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Verse 3, the Bible says, According as his divine power have given us how many things? All things that pertain unto life and what else? Godliness. Through the knowledge of him. That's the knowledge of God. That have called us to... Now remember the Bible says, Fear God and give what? Now, his divine power is necessary to give glory to him. It says, to give glory and virtue, verse 4, whereby are given us exceeding great, and what else? Precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the world, the, the corruption that is in the world through what? Then the Bible tells us how humanity can bind with divinity, and then in verse 10, it tells us the results. Look at verse 10. 2 Peter 1 verse 10 says, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election, what's the next word? Sure. For if you do these things, now notice what it says. It says, if you do these things, you shall, what's the next words? Now, brothers and sisters, it didn't say fall once a year. It says you shall what? 
Now, if we never fall, that means that we'll be prepared to do what? Stand. Now, inspiration says that if we teach, we should never fall. Is that what it said? Look back at the text. The last line in verse 12 says, for if you, what's the next word? Not preach, not teach. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. Then the devil's plan is to keep us in ignorance of what those things are that we should be doing. Because God has a part, he's going to do his part. And man has a part, our problem is we don't do what? Our part. Now, can we do our part without Jesus, yes or no? No. Can we do our part with Jesus, yes or no? The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who does it for me. The Bible says, who strengthens me. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that what this duty is called is the duty of the congregation on the Day of Atonement. That's all the duty is. Now, the duty is that we must go into the most holy place with Jesus. Now, the question is, how do we go into the most holy place? Do you want to go where Jesus is, yes or no? How did the priest get in? Did the priest fly into the most holy place? Did the priest ride a chariot into the most holy place? How did the priest get into the most holy place? What did he do? He did what? He walked. I want to ask you a question. Does the Bible teach us how to spiritually walk, yes or no? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. So my brothers and sisters, one of the legs by which we walk from the outer court into the most holy place to be with Jesus is by what? Faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, if faith is one leg, every man that walks, if he walks right, has to walk with two legs. Now, you can hop with one leg, but you've got to walk with two. Am I right? Now, my brothers and sisters, what do you think the second leg is? If one leg is faith, what do you think the second leg is? Faith and works. How do we walk in the sanctuary? Faith and works. Faith and works. We can go into the most holy place. Now, what makes the faith work? Galatians 5, verse 6. Galatians 5, verse 6. Let, let, in fact, let's read that. Galatians 5, verse 6. What makes the faith work? Galatians 5 and verse 6. Notice what the Bible says in Galatians 5 and verse 6. This is how we go into the most holy place. In Galatians 5, verse 6, the Bible says, we walk by faith and works. What makes them work? Galatians 5. In fact, let's pick up in verse 5. Galatians 5 and verse 5. The Bible says, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of what? Righteousness by faith. This is righteousness. Look at verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. Well, tell me, Paul, what matters? It says, but what? Faith, which worketh how? What makes faith work? Talk to me, somebody. You know, when Jesus said, if you love me, guess what? You will keep my commandments. Whether he gives us commandments and diet or commandments and dress or commandments and music or commandments and worship, my friends, if we are willing, if we love Jesus, whatever he says, we will do. In fact, if we're not willing to give something up for Jesus, it just identifies that we love that thing more than we love Jesus. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he... And if we're not willing to give up something, it just means that we don't love Jesus enough. You see, but when we love Jesus... We'll be willing to give up anything for the one we love. Love makes a difference when you love the one you know. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that God is going to bring us back to this point, and it says, it is those who by faith do what? Everything that prophet said. The Bible says we walk by what? Faith. It says it's those that by faith follow Jesus in the great work of the atonement who receive the benefits of his what? That means that in order to get his benefits, you've got to follow Jesus into the most holy place. You see, when God gives us a command in the Bible, faith says, whatever God says, I will do. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And if you love God and do what he says, faith and works brings you into the most holy place. Now, question, when you do everything God says, does that make you perfect? No. There's only one man that can make us perfect. What's his name? You know that our part is not to make ourselves perfect. Our part is not to make ourselves sinless. That is the part of the priest. But the priest will do his part when we are faithful in doing what? Now, if we do our part, it opens the door for Jesus to come in and do his part. He can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, this is God's plan. It says, in the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israel were required to gather where? About the sanctuary. And in the most solemn manner, humble their souls before God, that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the what? How much more essential in this, not typical day, but in this what? Anti-typical day of atonement that we understand two things. Number one, we're to understand the, what's the next word? Now, what is the work of the priest? I showed you what it was. What is the work of the priest? To bring us back to per, to bring us back to a sinless condition. That's the work of the priest, to cleanse the sanctuary. It says, to understand the work of a high priest and to know what, what's the next word? Duties are required, not asked, but what? Now, what if someone does not want to do the duties of the congregation on the Day of Atonement? Interesting says that not be what? That means they tell me that there are duties of the congregation on the Day of Atonement, and if we will not do these duties that are required of us, we shall be what? Now, do you know the Bible says the same thing in Leviticus 23? Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. And my brothers and sisters, no matter what it is, someone says, well, I don't like the duties. Well, do you know what inspiration says? That if we don't enter into these duties in this last generation, that we shall be, guess what? Cut off. And God doesn't want us to be cut off. He doesn't want us to be shaken out. Jesus went to the cross so that every sinner could be saved if we but come to Jesus Christ. I thank God for the everlasting gospel. What do you say? But now, my brothers and sisters, and you go, when you go into that most holy place, something takes place. You go inside that most holy place. The first thing you see is the Ark of the... What's in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. Remember what the Bible says in Revelation 11? It says, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Testament. That Ten Commandments inside the law of the law of God, inside that Ark of the Covenant. Now, question, is that a duty of man on the Day of Atonement, yes or no? You remember what the wise men said, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, and verse 13 and 14, he said, you know the text, repeat it with me. Let us hear the conclusion of the what? Oh, man. Fear. That almost sounds like the first angel's message. It says, fear God and keep his. Why? What does it say? For this is the, the whole what? That meant that inside that ark was the Ten Commandments. There was a duty of the congregation in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Do you know that this is what made Adventists become seven Adventists? This is where they found the Sabbath and the other truths. Do you know they connected with that law is always something else as well. Do you know that with the law always is connected something else? What do you think goes with the law? Somebody tell me. The prophets. Go to Zechariah chapter 7. Go to Zechariah 7. Look at Zechariah 7. You will see that all through the scripture, the law and the prophets go together. Look at Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah 7, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Zechariah chapter 7, I want you to see a pattern in the scripture. Zechariah 7, beginning in verse 14. Zechariah, verse 12. Zechariah 7, beginning in verse 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, in Zechariah 7, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, Yea, they made their hearts as adamant as what? Stone. Lest they should hear the... Now here's the law. Hear the law, but notice what's always connected with the law. Lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his what? Spirit. How? By the former prophets. So if the spirit had prophets, this is the spirit of prophecy. So what two things always go together? The law and the prophets. It says, through the spirit of the prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Now, do you know if you study from Genesis to Revelation, you see the same thing, that the law and the prophets always go together from the Old Testament to the so-called New Testament. Let's go, to, let's go to Acts 24. Go to Acts 24. Let's see that there. In the book of Acts 24, we see the same scripture. Now, why is this important? Look, brothers and sisters. Who is this right here? Anybody know who this is? This is Sister White. Now, do you know that in order to enter and stay in the most holy place, you must embrace the spirit of prophecy. Amen. That when a man does not embrace the spirit of prophecy, that Jesus must send him back out of the most holy place. Because inside the most holy place, Jesus leads us to the law and the... 
Now, I'm going to show you that from Scripture. Now, watch this, brothers and sisters. This is a duty of the congregation on the Day of Atonement. We're going to see that this is God's plan on the Day of Atonement, that the law and the prophets always go together. Look at Acts 24. Acts 24, beginning in verse 14. Acts 24, beginning in verse 14. Notice what he says. He says, but this I do what? Confess unto thee, that after the way which they call what? That's amazing. Time has not changed. They call what we're talking about today in the day, days of Paul, they called it heresy, fanaticism, extremism, legalism. They said the same to the apostle Paul. Acts 24, 14 says, but I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my what? Believing. What do you believe, apostle? Believe in how many things? All things which are written where? In the law, but don't give me the prophets. Is that what he said? He said, the way I worship is that I believe all things that are written in the law and in the... Now, anybody who believes the same thing that the Apostle Paul believed back then, we call it today heresy. We call it today fanaticism. We call it today extremism. In fact, we have a church today that are afraid to even mention Sister White from the pulpit. We're afraid of it. We have forgotten that this is part of what God has given us on the Day of Atonement. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. Every other religion are proud of their prophets except for Seventh-day Adventists. Joseph Smith, the Mormon, the, the prophet, they, the Mormons, they don't, they don't hide Joseph Smith. They lift him up in the first study. You can't get out of the first study without them telling you about the prophet, so-called Joseph Smith. You look at the Hindus and the, and, 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 and the Muslims, they will not hide their so-called holy men and faithful men, right? In fact, if you look at Muhammad, which is supposed to be the prophet of Muslim, you know that you can't talk any way you want about a Muslim prophet. They will kill you. Am I right or wrong? They will kill you for talking about Muhammad. And it's amazing. They have false prophets, and the one that have true prophets are afraid to even mention her name. We come into the church and it's time, I, and the minister, I, 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 I have to tell you that somebody has told us something. No! God has given us a prophet. Amen. And the Bible says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you what? Prosper. The law and the prophets go together. Amen. In fact, do you know that on, in the sanctuary, if you were to study Deuteronomy 31, do you know that while the ark, while the Ten Commandments went on the inside, that the Bible actually says that there was something put on the outside of that ark? Does the Bible say so, yes or no? Amen. Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 to 26, we're told that there was something called the book of the? That book of the law was nothing more than the writings of the living prophet that died just before they got into the promised land. They were to take that law, put it inside the ark, on the side of the ark, and then they were to put that law somewhere. Now question, watch this law. That book of the law was put not on the inside, it was put where? Praise God. You saw that sign? Yes. Now, you didn't see it. Let me back it up. Let me make sure she's here. Praise God. You know that God took people to put this law on side. Why? Because the law and the prophets go where? Together. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration says that these laws were nothing more than the writings of the prophet. The anti-typical book of the law is not simply the writings of Moses. It is the spirit of what? That's why the Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of the sea, which keep the, that's the law. What should go with it? Talk to me. The law of God and the testimony of Jesus, which is the, everywhere in the Bible, to the law and to the what? But the Bible says that when you get rid of the law, guess what else you have to get rid of? You get rid of the law, you must get rid of the prophets. And do you know this is what's happened to the Christian church? that the Christian church had prophets. But during the Dark Ages, from 538 to 1798, the little horn, the papacy, rose up into the Christian church, and guess what they did? They went to the law, and they thought to do what? Change what? Times and... Now, and for, the, for nearly 1,260 years, the Christian church lost sight of the law of God, and as a result, no law, no what? Prophets. In fact, go to Lamentations 10. Two, Lamentations 2. You were just in Zechariah. You're going over Lamentations. Go to Lamentations, the second chapter. That's that little book tucked away between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Lamentations chapter 2. Notice this for yourself. Lamentations 2. Now watch what the prophet says. In Lamentations 2 verse 9, the Bible says, Her gates are what? 
sunk into the ground. He had destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the what? Now notice again, law and the prophets go together. It says, the law is what? No more. Now if we're right, what would you expect to be the next thing that the Bible speaks of? The law and the? Now watch what it says. It says, her law is no more. Her prophets also find, guess what? So that means to tell me that when there's no law, there is no what? Visions. Now my question is, after the dark ages, when did the Christian church again get back the visions? When did God give us back the law? You remember on October 22nd, 1844, when Jesus moved from the holy into the most holy place, the Christian church was brought back face to face with the law of Jehovah inside the ark. Now, what was God ready to give back to the Christian church? Not only the law, but the visions. So God gave us a spirit of prophecy. Interesting says, as the end draws near and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies which God in his providence has linked with the work of the what message? Third angel's message from its very what? It was not long after the passing of time in 1844 that my first vision was what? Why? Because the law and the prophets go where? Together. And so guess what? If I reject the law, I'm going to reject the prophets. And if I reject the prophet, I will also reject the And so the prophet says, that tells us very carefully, brothers and sisters, one thing is certain. Those seven Adventists, not the world, but those seven Adventists who take their stand under whose banner? Satan's banner is the mark of the beast. It says they will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the what? testimony of God. But you know, when you see a seven Adventist that does not like the spirit of prophecy, he's been taught this and showed this and still hates the testimony of Jesus. You are looking at a seven Adventist that is getting ready to receive the mark of the if he does not repent and run to Jesus. You see, the testimony of Jesus is not called the testimony of Sister White. It's called the testimony of that's amazing to me, brothers and sisters. Do you know that all of this is nothing more than gifts that come from Jesus Christ? In fact, go to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to the heart of this message, show us, dear God, that if ever there was a time to run to Jesus, the time is now. Please, dear God, help us to run into that most holy place before it is everlasting too late. Please, dear God, in Jesus' name, amen. In fact, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5. We'll go to Hebrews 5 and then to Ephesians 4. Hebrews 5, look at Hebrews 5. The Bible tells us that in order to bring us back to perfection, that God must give us something very important because the work of being brought back to perfection is not the work of the sinner. It's the work of the priest. Look at Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 1. How does Jesus bring us back to perfection? Hebrews 5, verse 1, the Bible says... For every what? High priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both. What's the next word? Yes. Now, it's amazing, brothers and sisters, that God has gifts for us that we don't yet receive. Do you know everybody in the world likes gifts? You talk to a child, he likes gifts. You tell him it's Christmas, he likes gifts. You tell him it's his birthday, what does he want? What does he want? He wants a what? And even adults, you like gifts too. Don't act like you don't like gifts. Everybody here, somebody says, oh, I have a gift for you. All of a sudden, you start smiling. You're beaming. How you have you a gift? What do you have? <laughs> Jesus has gifts for us as well. In fact, Hebrews 5 says that the high priest offers two things to bring us back to perfection. That he may offer both what? Gifts and what else? Sacrifices for sins. Now, we know about the sacrifice, but we don't understand the gift. Think about the sacrifice. Who is the sacrifice? Jesus. Now, what are they for? Both of these is for sin, sacrifices for sins. What do the sacrifice do to bring us back to perfection? The Bible says, behold the Lamb of God, which does what? Amen. Takes away the sin of the world. The sacrifice removes sin from the sinner, but what about the gifts? The gifts 
are for sin. What about the gifts? Notice Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible tells us that there's something about those gifts. And I'm going to tell you something. If God gives me gifts, I want every gift he has for me. What do you say? How can man fight a gift? You see, the duty of the congregation is not only a duty, it's a privilege and a beauty when you go inside that most holy place. Notice Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Jesus has gifts for us in order to bring us back to perfection. In fact, what if I said to you today that I wanted you to get down to California and I wanted you to get there in five hours? Someone says, well, you know, I'm in Maryland. There's no way in the world that I can walk to California in five hours. Somebody says that is impossible. Question, is it possible to get to, from Maryland to California in five hours? Yes or no? Yes. How? Airplane. airplane. Now, my brother says, somebody says, well, I don't have an airplane. Well, do you know what if God said, I have purchased a ticket for you that you can get on that airplane for free if you simply just go down there to the airport, I will take you for free. If man said that it was impossible to get to California in five hours, that man would only be lost because he did not accept the gift that God gave him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that Jesus has given us gifts? And if we don't accept the gifts and are not brought back to perfection, it is nobody's fault but what? Ours. Notice Ephesians of chapter 4. Beginning in verse 8, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. And verse 8, the Bible says, Ephesians 4, verse 8, you're there, amen, let's read that together. The Bible says, wherefore, he said, Jesus, when he ascended up on high, the ascension of Christ, he led captivity captive and gave what? Yes. Gifts unto men. When Jesus went back to heaven as our high priest, he sent back gifts to men. Do you know that repentance is a gift? The Holy Spirit is a gift. This is the gift of the work of the priest to bring us back to salvation. In fact, brothers and sisters, what are the gifts for? Look at verse 12. Ephesians 4 verse 12 tells us what the gifts are for. Verse 12 says that these gifts are for what? The perfecting of the... So these gifts are to bring us back to perfection. These are the work for the edifying of the body of Christ. And if we reject the gifts, can we be brought back to perfection, yes or no? Can we blame Jesus, the priest, when he gave us gifts to perfect us and we reject the gifts, can we blame him for not being brought back to perfection, yes or no? Then what is one of these gifts? Look at verse 11. Ephesians 5, 4 verse 11 says, And he gave gifts, some apostles. Some prophets. So the spirit of prophecy is the gift of what? Prophecy. So if I do not accept the gift of prophecy from Jesus, my high priest, can I complain if I'm not brought back to perfection? Oh, no. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that this is what the prophet meant when she says that one thing is certain that those seven Adventists who reject the testimonies, that they will not be standing with Jesus but under the black banner of the devil himself? Why? Because don't you know that how you treat a gift demonstrates the way you feel about the giver of the gift? Am I right or wrong? I tell you every time that do you know that if someone were to give us a gift right here, and you would take somebody's gift, and you would take that gift and throw that gift down on the ground and stump on the gift and stump on the gift, would you say, oh, he loves the gift? Would you say that? Because the way you treat the gift demonstrates the way you feel about the giver of the And if we reject Jesus, not one of us can be saved, and that's why it's called the testimony of what? Jesus. Now, I wonder how many believe in the spirit of prophecy. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. Do you know that every truth that God has given us in the last days is nothing more than a gift? Do you know that health reform is a gift? Amen. Dress reform is a gift. Amen. Music reform is a gift. Education reform is a gift. It's designed to bring us back to perfection. All of these are gifts, and it's because of the rejection of these gifts that my brothers and sisters, that the seven of his church is in such a languishing position, but what we need is not condemnation, but what? Education. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You know that right now that many seven Adventists are fighting the very gifts 
that could bring us back to perfection if we simply open up our hands to receive this gift. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring out these final points, show us, Lord, that these gifts are given to us for Jesus so that we can be saved in the last days for time is running out. Help us, Lord, to get ready, to get ready, to get ready. Please, dear God, in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I want these gifts. What do you say? Now, listen to me. It says, at this time, it says, at this time, when we are so near the end, shall we become so, shall we become so like the world in practice that men may look in vain to find God's denominated what? Shall any man sell our peculiar characteristics as God's chosen people for any advantage the world has to give? Shall the favor of those who transgress the law of God be looked upon as of great value? Shall those whom the Lord has named his people suppose that there is any power higher than the great I am? Shall we endeavor to blot out the distinguishing points of what? Of faith that have made us what? Do you know that there's a specific faith that has made a seven heaven is Brother Garrison? Would you help me real quick? Would you go to the back, please? Thank you. There's a specific, there is a specific message to the laptop. There's a specific message that has made us seven day Adventists question what message has made us seven day Adventists? Where would I go in the sanctuary to find the origin of seven day Adventism? Out of court, holy place, or most holy place? I'm gonna tell you something. The reason, before you take it, I'm, I'm going to show you just a moment. Give me one moment. Now, before you do this, watch this now. Satan knew that the way to bring the seven Adventist church into amnesia was to take the message that revealed our identity. Now, the message that reveals our identity is the first, the second, and the what? Third angel's message. Did the prophet tell us that our religion will be changed, yes or no? The prophet told us. He said, our religion would be what? Did the prophet tell us this, yes or no? The greatest evidence that our religion has been changed is this symbol where? Do you know, brothers and sisters, this symbol is the sign that our religion has been what? Now, there are many sincere people that do not know this. Does God condemn them, yes or no? What we need is not condemnation, but what? Now, what is our true message is the one identified by the what? First, the second, and the what? Third angels. Why? Because when you study this message, you will find out something. When you study this message, you will find that the only, the, the, the only place that you find, the only place that you find the, 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 the flame that we look upon, the only place in the sanctuary you find that flame is not in the most holy place. You find it where? Do you know that this symbol, the flame, is a message that takes us right back to the outer court? It makes us lose our identity. Our identity is found inside the most holy place. What message brings us into the most holy place? The first, the second, and the third angel. The first angel says, fear God, give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is... Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. Where does the hour of judgment come? Does the hour of judgment come in the outer court? Does the hour of judgment come in the holy place? So the first angel takes us straight into the what? Most holy place with the law and with the prophets. Do you know when you get into the most holy place, everything in our life changes. Diet changes. Music changes, recreation changes, education changes, dress changes, life changes. Why? Because whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we're to do it all to the glory of God. Everything changes. Now, I know that somebody told me this. You know what somebody told me? They told me, I'm going to back up just to this point. I'm as I close, no, no. Somebody told me, they said, you know, that the, that, 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 back up to here, they said, you know, that the, 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 the symbol of, uh, of, of, the, of, of this with the flame right here, they said the symbol of this flame that that really represents the first, the second, and the third angel. And I said, now listen. So, you say, so that's, that's worse than creative thinking. Now, that, that, I mean, think about this now. Think about this, brother and sister. You may have tell me that, but listen, I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. I mean, think, I, so I did some research, just, just so you can see. Now, I want you to see, come back here. Somebody say, every time you see this, this happened. Now, Ted Cruz was running for president. He had a flame. How many, how many strokes? Now, I know he wasn't preaching to three angels. Now, mind you, his, his wife is a seven Adventist. Take Cruz's wife. Her family grew up in Loma Linda. Now, here at Great Awakening, all the churches, day, spring, one, two, three, all this flame, human rights. Now, you know they're not preaching three angels. One, two, three. Look at this. Church of God. How many, how many symbols? One, two, three. No. Look at this. This says, this is a shutter stop, an image. It has a flame. 
It has a cross. It has a what? What does that look like? What does that look like? It looks just like my brothers and sisters, the flame. You see, God has given us a symbol, and the devil has tried to rob us of our distinct what? Identity. The devil does not want us to know who we are. Why? Because when we understand who we are, we will wake up so that Satan's head can be crushed. This is what the devil is afraid of. Now, would you, would you jump down to 76, 70, 75, 75 in the slide? Now, my brothers and sisters, I hate to have to do this, but I want you to see something as we're closing. I'm going to tell you something. If we understood where we were prophetically, 75, if we understood where we were prophetically, we would say to God, we would say to God, Lord, I don't want to leave this place. You know, some people, they watch their watches at church. But when they go to the theaters, they don't look at their watch no more. They go to the ball game, no watch. They go into the basketball game, no watch. They go to the football game, no watch. They go to playing, no watch. They come to church, watch. But I'm going to tell you soon, when Jesus then looks at the clock and the Sunday law, he's going to look at his watch and you're going to tell him, give us more time. You don't want time now, but you're going to want it then. God's given us time now so we can be ready then. I don't know about you, but I want to take advantage of everything God gave us. What do you say? You see, the Bible says redeem the time. You see, when you understand this, things change. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that in everything would change if we understood this. Because you see, our time is running out. Interesting says there is a limit. And do you know that the predominant social condition that always marks that a limit is about to be reached is the prevalence of homosexuality in society. Am I right? Now, how many were here when I was here last in 2013? Anybody was here when I was here last in 2013? Let me see the hands. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In 2013, I'm going to tell you something. Now, if you remember, I ended the slide with this right here. Last four years ago, I showed you there was a limit. I showed you that Solomon Gomorrah was this limit. I showed you this right here where it says, voters approve what? Same-sex marriage for the first time. That was 2012. Now, if you remember, I showed you this from the screen four years ago. Am I right or wrong? Now, my brothers and sisters, we showed you this was the first time. Now, it started in 20 what? 12. Now, in 2012, it says, rarely do popular votes reflect such a dramatic social change. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this as we close is because whatever happens to homosexuality also happens to the passing of a national Sunday law. Now, I showed you this in 2012, and I told you that when you saw this, that we're getting close to a time when we would see a national same-sex law. Did I tell you that, yes or no? We start walking this. Now, you, you, you acting like I'm alive. Did I tell you that, yes or no? I'm in time, all these people here are saying, oh, he's lying. No, nah, you were here four years ago. It says, in the 1990s, most Americans told posters they did not know anyone close to them who was gay. Could they get a same-sex law passed in 1990? No. Why? In America, the majority vote passes. It says, by 2010, the number of Americans who said their gay or lesbian close friends stood at what? Four numbers. Could they get it through? No. Why? Majority vote. But then in 2012, it says this year, that number stands at what? 60%. Could they get a, a vote through? Yes or no? Now remember, whatever happens to same-sex law is going to happen to the national Sunday law. Question, it started in two states. What started in two states came and took over the entire nation, and now there's a national same-sex law. Am I right? Yes or no? Now I want to ask you a question. If it started in 2012, what year did it end? What year did it end? I want 2015. Now watch this. Obama says gay marriage doesn't weaken family. It does what? But remember, why do they go together? You see, if we had time, I'm closing, but if we had time, I would show you from the Bible that Lucifer was the first homosexual and Lucifer started the first Sunday worship and homosexuality and Sunday worship go together. The Bible says that. Now, watch this, brothers and sisters. There's such a thing called twin institutions, blessed days of Eden. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin as what? Now, a twin institution has a relationship. We see the true marriage true Sabbath, are linked together as twins, but inspiration says that everything that God does, Satan has a... Satan can present a counterfeit so closely resembling the true that it deceives those who are willing to be what? Deceived. So my brothers and sisters, everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit. So if God has twin institutions, Satan has a counterfeit what? Twin institution. If God's true marriage is between man and woman, according to Matthew 19, 
then what would be the counterfeit marriage? Talk to me, somebody. Same-sex marriage. Now, if God has a true seven-day Sabbath, Satan's counterfeit would be what? What would be Satan's counterfeit Sabbath? National Sunday law. And these two would be linked. Now, the only way to know a counterfeit, it has to resemble the true. So which one of these must come first? In the true. Remember now, the power of a counterfeit is that it must look like the true. And so my brothers and sisters, in the creation on day six, God made man in his image and gave them the gift of marriage. When did the Sabbath come? After marriage. First marriage, then Sabbath. So in the counterfeit, what's going to come first? Same sex and then same sex, uh, then national Sunday law. Now my brothers and sisters, when you go through this, you begin to see. Then in 2013, something happened, first Jesuit pope, for a reason. The first Jesuit pope came on time. There's a reason, brothers and sisters, why this is happening now. This is the reason why the prominent gay rights magazines honors the pope. Why? Because homosexuality and Sunday worship, guess what? Go together. On the front cover of this greatest or the largest uh, homosexual magazine called The Advocate, they have the pope right there saying no H8. I don't have time to talk about that. It says, if someone is gay and seeks the Lord, God, who are goodwill, who am I to what? You know what the Pope said? The Pope says, Pope Francis says, the church should apologize to what? I'm going to tell you something. This Pope knows how to Pope. <laughs> now look at this. This Pope told us this. Then in the Supreme Court, what took place? Setting the stage, the Supreme Court announced that it would rule for this. And it says that they argued in April and a decision is expected by late what? Did they make a decision in June of 2015? Did the Supreme Court, the highest body, legislative body of America, the Congress, the Senate, did they make a decision, yes or no? Now watch this now. Now notice they didn't make a slow decision. Supreme Court races the what? Now the inspiration says the final movements would be what? Rapid ones. Now, 2020, by 2015, it says... New NBC News, landmark, Supreme Court rules same-sex marriage legal what? How long did it take? From 2012 to 2015, the first twin was born. I was here in 2012 before it ever happened. I told you this was going to take place. From the Bible, showed you the text. And I said, but after we see the national same-sex law, it's time for the next twin to be born. Are there any twins in this room today? Any twins in this room today? I see a twin back there in the back. Question, which twin was born for first? You were the first twin born first. Praise God! Now, I want to ask you a question. How long before your second twin came out? Three years? hundred years? Is there a relationship between, between the coming out twins? Is there a relationship? When the first twin is born, the second twin is about to be born. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You know, this is one of the greatest evidences that the National Senate Law is going to be passed, not in the next generation. They're going to be passed in what? This generation. The same generation. That the national same-sex law is the same generation of the Sunday law. The first one popped out in just a few years. We have but a few short months left before this takes place. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's why the first counterfeit twin is born. Now, we're going to finish this tonight, but I want you to see something as we're closing right now. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. The first twin is already born. Now, if the first twin is born, what happened just a few months after that? The Pope came where? To America. June, same-sex law. September, First time a pope goes to Congress. If you, you know when a baby's getting ready to be born, it takes a few months before it be, starts born, and you can take an ultrasound, and if you look at the ultrasound, even though everything's not developed, you can begin to see the arms before it's fully developed. Do you know that in 2015, when you saw the pope go to Congress, if you had a prophetic ultrasound, you could see that the Sunday baby, that the baby, the, 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 the baby of the papacy, the child, that the son in law was getting ready to be born. You could see the arms beginning to develop. Do you know that in 2017, with the election of Donald Trump, we're going to show you tonight that as the first President Obama brought us the first twin, that this next president is going to lay the foundation for the second twin. And if you're rushing to get out of here, 
That shows me we don't understand what's getting ready to take place. Because the only one that's rushing time is the devil right now. You know what? He understands that should we understand what's taking place in this final generation, that somebody will wake up. You know that when this meeting is over, some people are going to hear the message for the last time to get ready, to get ready. And God's saying, please don't take this lightly. Jesus is about to come. Jesus has laid every foundation. And do you know that this year, now listen to me, we're going to show you on the screen tonight. We're going to show you if ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. We're going to show you this screen. You know, the, you know, what, the, you know what, the, uh, what, what, what Babylon said, the leader of Babylon said just before his fall, you remember, he said, is this not what? Great Babylon. What did Donald Trump just say? We're going to make America what? I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says that this is the last. We're going to show you. This is the last conditions before the national Sunday law is passed in America and Seventh Adventists were sleeping. We're sleeping. I'm going to tell you, my brother and sister, you, my brother and sister from India, from India, listen to me carefully. If you love your people in India, you would tell them this message. You know why? Listen to me. The Pope is going to India this year. Never happened. I'm going to show you on the screen. Do you know that, the, that right now, one of the leading Hindu religious leaders said to the Pope, you are welcome to come to India. And the Pope, he went to Africa. Remember, 2015, he went to Africa after he left America. He went to, China, he went to the, all the islands. He wants to conquer the East now. The West is in his pocket. Europe in his pocket. Britain in his pocket. America in his pocket. Africa in his pocket. Now he wants China and India. I'm going to tell you something. If ever there was a time to get ready, the time is now. Let us pray. Oh, Father, the handwriting is on the wall. But, Lord, our life is no different. You've given us the gift of health reform. You've given us the gift of dress reform. You've given us the gift of the music and the message that would lead us into heavenly places. You've given us the gift of prophecy. You've given us your, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. You've given us all the gifts that heaven could give us, and still we are rejecting those gifts that are designed to bring us back to perfection. And if we're lost, Lord, it's going to be nobody's fault but our own. But Lord, we're here this morning because we don't want to be lost. We want Jesus. We want salvation. And we ask, Lord, that you would open up our minds and hearts because what we need, Lord, is a change of heart that will prepare us for these last days. And so I pause this prayer, and I want to lift that appeal that if someone says, Dear God, I see the handwriting, but I know that I'm not ready. But you want to be ready. I want you to lift your hand wherever you are. You're saying, Lord, I want to remember who you are and who I am. I want to remember my identity. I want to understand the message and accept the gifts so that you can bring me back to perfection so that Satan's head can be crushed. That sin and sinners can be destroyed. That Eden lost can become Eden restored. That the story of redemption can come to an end. Lord, we want to live with you forever. Thank you that you made it possible that the worst sinner in this world can be saved today if we come to Jesus. But we must remember that you are not in the outer court. You are not in the holy place, but you are in the most holy place, and that means that our life must change if we're going to meet you there. Bring us this revival and reformation. Thank you for what you did for us today and what you will do for the remainder of this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation.